Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. It looks like uh, a few people are filing in. We will go ahead and um, kind of slow pace uh, the, the, co the content here for a few minutes to make sure that, that everybody is able to join us. Um, my name is Andrew Bowen. I'm from Language Testing International. We are the exclusive provider of all ACTFL language assessments. Uh, and my job is very easy today, and that is to introduce someone who uh, requires no introduction. I hate to be cliche, um, but it is what it is. <laughs> Um, our, our webinar today, of course, is, is titled Nationwide, Nationwide Patterns in Sealed Biliteracy Implementation. Uh, the plan was to have both Dr. Margaret Malone and, and her colleague, uh, Margaret Boracek, join us today. Unfortunately, Margaret Boracek has fallen ill and she will be unable to join us today. Um, however, as far as the you know questions and the follow-up go, uh, she will be uh, ready and willing to to respond to you know any inquiries that come of a result as a result of uh, of today's webinar. Uh, so just very quickly. Uh, Dr. Mar Margaret Malone is coming to us from uh, Georgetown University. She is the director of the Assessment and Evaluation Language Resource Center there, also known as the ALERC. Uh, she is also a research professor at Georgetown University. In addition to all of that, in case it weren't enough, she's, she's also the director of the Center for Assessment Research and Development at ACTFL. Uh, she has nearly three decades, that's right, three decades of experience in language test development, uh, materials development, delivery of professional development, and teacher training through both online and face-to-face -face methods, data collection, and survey research and program evaluation. I'm going to go ahead and take a few minutes to take a breath after getting all of that out. Oh, her current research focuses on language assessment literacy, uh, oral proficiency assessment, the influences of the seal of biliteracy on language teaching and learning, and last but certainly not least, the development of shortcut measures of proficiency. Uh, a little fun fact about her as far as her, her resume goes, um, earlier in, in her career, she actually served as the first language testing specialist for the Peace Corps. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Malone. Uh, but before I before I do that, one more small item. So, sorry, Meg. Uh, as questions come to mind, please go ahead and type them into the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. I will be collecting those, and we will be delivering those to Dr. Malone uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, we will have a, a quick Q and A after she presents her research and and her survey findings. Uh, the questions tab is not to be confused with the chat tab. Uh, so please go ahead and type those in there and we will have those addressed um, once Dr. Malone has gotten through her content. And now I will go ahead and pass the, the baton to Dr. Malone. Hi everybody. Um, I'm going to be looking both to the right and to the left because I have my notes on either side of me um, and I'm going to be doing my best to make contact with you. Um, first of all, I hope that you are all safe and well. It's really nice to um, see so many attendees. Um, I hope you're taking good care of yourselves. And I just want to say, with everything going on, I admire you so much for taking 45 minutes of your time to hear about this. Um, one caveat, I am presenting here in my role as the director of the AELRC and not in my role as the director of the Center for Assessment Research and Development at ACTFL. If I were presenting in that role, I would be wearing my ACTFL baseball hat. Um, and I do look forward to your questions. I've set this up so that we have some time for discussion. So, a little background. If you're here, you probably know what the seal of biliteracy is, but it doesn't hurt to um, remind you. Uh, one thing to remember is that it's a way to credential students' literacy or fluency in two languages by high school graduation, mostly according to locally developed tests. And the seal of biliteracy is aimed at students in dual language, ESL and world language pro programs. So what are we doing here? Um, the seal of biliteracy is still kind of young. It's still um, nascent, to use a more technical term. And one thing we've noticed is, you know, we hear things in the field such as um, some students have more access to, to it than others. What are some ways we can get more access to students? So Margaret and I decided to conduct um, a nationwide survey to understand patterns and potential issues about the SEAL implementation. And let me explain, it's less that we're looking for problems here and more that we're trying to nip any barriers to it in the bud by identifying what 
issues might exist and help come up with some strategies for addressing them. Because you know, my goal is for every student who wants to obtain the seal to be able to obtain it. So just to understand where we're coming from. I'm going to give you a little bit of the literature review. One of the, one of the most exciting things about working in a nascent area like this is that the lit review is constantly expanding, but it's also very doable. Um, in some other areas that I work in, um, I'd have to go back 60 years to um, see the history, but the nice thing about the seal is that it is not 60 years old yet, but someday I bet it will be. Um, so one issue that has come up in some of the research is information dissemination um, as one of the issues in implementation of the seal in Illinois, with a great article written by some of our colleagues published in one of my favorite journals, Foreign Language Annals. Um, and another is that of assessment choices. In other words, that students are able to demonstrate their language proficiency through assessments. And there are a few ways, and as you all know, the SEAL differs from state to state. So um, some of the things we're looking at are nationwide patterns, but of course it's always within the context of what is applicable in your specific state. So um, some of the ways that we demonstrate language proficiency is of course through a score, um, on a recognized assessment, um, meeting minimum GPA requirements, seat time, a project or portfolio, a transcript from outside the US. Um, and just to go back to what Davin Heineke, Heineke and Ignatz found was that um, more outreach was needed before high school and in beginner level high school language classes since students often didn't find out. So both promotion and um, assessment choices and explaining about assessment choices is is very, very important. Um, and so that's something that we're gonna be focusing on in this presentation today. Um, I don't know how many of you, if we were doing this in person, um, I would be talking, I would say, how many of you have heard of washback? Um, washback basically is how an assessment has an influence on teaching and learning and a positive influence. So one of the things that we're thinking of um, with the seal of biliteracy is um, what is its hope and potential to promote more proficiency-based teaching because teachers need to aim toward proficiency goals that are very specifically defined. Um, and they're able to then aim toward what a student can do with the language uh, rather than what they know about the language. And of course, uh, policymakers were also hoping that it would spark more interest in language learning across the grades. And so one of the things we we are hoping, and as Davin, Heineke, and Egnatz found, um, was looking at changes to instruction. Um, so there was some change to instruction assessment based on information, and some increased world language retention and enrollment, which is you know a great thing for our field. Um, there was also a study conducted in Los Angeles by Castro Santana, um, and they saw a 20 to 25 percent growth in enrollment. Yes and um, more students taking Spanish proficiency assessments. So these are some things that can lead to washback. Um, however, it is important to identify some of the concerns that have, that have emerged. Um, one issue is that of equity and access, um, where policies have been found to inadvertently advantage English dominant students because specific states ask English learners to provide more sources of evidence to demonstrate their English proficiency than English dominant students. And the level of English proficiency demanded is generally higher than that of the other language. And of course, there are uh, specific tests needed to demonstrate proficiency. In addition, um, for teachers who are either conducting alternative assessments or um, supporting students in obtaining the SEAL, there is, in many cases, inadequate compensation for those professionals who are supporting the SEAL of biliteracy. So, um, Margaret and I decided to conduct a nationwide survey, and this represents the most recent um, round of data collection. We're still collecting some data. At some point, I guess we're just gonna have to stop. Um, but our first question is, um, what means of SEAL of biliteracy information dis dissemination are found across states? In other words, what are some things that we find? Um, what's most popular? Um, also, how do educators across the US approach assessment of proficiency for the SEAL? You know, what are their beliefs? What are their practices? And then finally, 
how do educators perceive the impact of the seal on teaching practices? So this is a really exciting study and I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about what we found. Um, as you'll see, we have a lot of data, so I'm just trying to focus on a few things in this presentation, otherwise we'd be here all day. And the last thing, of course, we're looking at is what barriers do educators perceive to seal of literacy attainment? And again, this is not about pointing fingers. This is about identifying now when the seal is still in its nascent phases, what are the barriers so we can start addressing them before they become fossilized? So what were our methods? Um, the first thing we did was design a survey. As Andrew mentioned, I have uh, conducted many surveys in my life. It's one of my favorite forms of data collection. But one of the things we did first was have the survey reviewed by 10 reviewers with expertise in survey design and or seal of literacy policy so that we could make sure we were asking the right questions. And that was super helpful because we got a lot of feedback, you know, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? I won't name names because they're, um, of course, confidential, but we had the best in the business who worked on seal of literacy working on this. Um, so um, basically, Based on these suggestions, we put together a final version. And um, we had two rounds of distribution, and this is a little technical about how to do um, survey research. Anyone who did survey research before um, the internet and something called SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics, you know, we used to send out paper things. It was, you know, you usually got a 99% um, response rate. It's very different now. So the first thing we did was compile contacts for 200 to 250 educators per state that had the seal, so that we could be contacting educators who we knew were working with it. So we set up the same survey, but we also copied it, um, copied the survey so that we did a second round disseminating through listservs and newsletters and social media. And that's so that we could see the difference in how we got the data from the two different groups. Um, and then our analysis with our multiple choice questions, we looked at frequencies, and then for open-ended responses, we looked at thematic code. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some of the responses. Um, I think this is really exciting. Andrew, you better sit down. Andrew gets really, really psyched when he sees this stuff. Um, She's so you not can kidding. See to date, yeah, sit down, Andrew. Um, we've had 778 participants, which is great. Um, and you can see on this beautiful pie chart um, whom they consist of. Uh, and you can see, not surprisingly, the overwhelming majority are world language teachers. More than half of all of our respondents have been world language teachers. Um, that was followed by district administrators at 11.7% and school counselors at 8.2%. Um, so we see this discrepancy. If you look how many ESL teachers or ELA teachers were involved in this, so far less. Um, and this may be simply due to the fact that there might be fewer ESL teachers employed per school than world language teachers, um, if there are any at all at some schools. But another reason could be that ESL teachers are also uninformed about the SEAL to begin with, um, which is supported by research by Davin and Hyatt McKee. So I just, I'm just going to let you look at this um, beautiful pie chart. Sorry, I love charts, and I want to make sure that you get a chance to look at it and to see just the differences between who responded. Um, OK. OK, so those were our participants. Um, in addition, we looked to see who responded by state, and the most respondents were from New York, Maryland, and Rhode Island. Um, I'm not sure why that happened. It could just be that people in those states love surveys or they'd heard more about it, but that's just who we got. So now I'm gonna show you some of the results, all right? Think about these participants when you're looking at the results. So one of the first things we looked at was um, regarding promotion. And one of the questions we asked was, how are students in your school or district informed that they can apply for the SEAL? And they were able to select multiple options. So you see that 81% of students who heard about the SEAL heard about it in world language class announcements. Now, this isn't surprising because, of course, most of our respondents were world language teachers, but you see that's slightly more than um, the number of world language teachers. You can see that was followed by announcements in ESL classrooms, 38%, and school counselor advising. Now note that this adds up to more than 100 because of course we wanted to see all methods that were used. Um, the next thing we asked was the grades in which students were notified about the seal of biliteracy. Um, and I have a couple minutes, so I'm gonna tell you a little story. When my daughter was in middle school, she came home one day 
she takes Latin and she said to me, mom, did you know that I can get credit for taking a language, for a language by taking a test? By taking a test, mom. And I said to her, this is totally new to me. No, I didn't. I said to her, do you have any idea what I do for a living and how much influence the organization I work for had in that? And she said, no. But I was really psyched because she actually is taking Latin, which is, you know, uh, of course included in the school in the seal of biliteracy um but i was also excited that she was in middle school and she was also hearing about it and that she was getting herself set up for it then but you can see where most students um the time at which most students are informed about it um mostly in ninth grade a little bit you know next in, in 11th grade but of course by that time as we know that sometimes a little late for students to start planning for anything new in their testing schedule so the next, one of the next things we asked for, this obviously is not exhaustive or we'd be here till five o'clock Eastern time. So then we turn to looking at assessment practices. Um, and each state has this information about which tests they will accept to demonstrate proficiency either in a world language or in English, and that can be found online. Um, we want to see which are most commonly used across the US and which are being used not as often. So participants were asked about which tests they used to examine, to assess world language and English proficiency in their school or districts. And of course, they were allowed to select multiple options because we know there are. And what we found for world language proficiency is that AP exams were identified as um, the most common. More than half of participants said those are used, followed by Actful's Apple, and then the stamp 4S. Um, now for English language proficiency, this is interesting as well. Um, we found that the three most common ways that students are assessed is um, through statewide assessments, through well, first through the state English language assessment, then through other state English assessments, and then through the AP English exam. Hang on, let me go back to this so that you can look at it again. So I just want you to compare the difference here. So you see the AP English exam represents a much smaller percentage of the tests that count for English proficiency than um, in world language. Okay, the next thing we looked at was who pays for the test. And you can see what our possible responses were. The first was, of course, um, and because we think that this is one of the things that can uh, serve as a barrier for students. Um, so the blue line shows the district pays, and you see you have world language tests who pays for those on the left, on my left, and then English tests on the other side. And if you look at that blue line, you can see that districts are more likely to pay for the English test in all cases than the world language test. Then you see the red line, which is that the district pays in high need cases. Then the yellow bar, shows that the school pays in all in all cases and then you see the green bar that shows that the school might pay in high need cases then we have the orange bar for the student i just want you to see how much higher that is in world languages than in english and then of course we have the popular other okay so i'm just going to leave this up for one second so that you can look at it and see who's paying for it okay so our next question was what are the home languages of students? So next we asked participants if students in their districts and schools have been able to earn the seal in languages that are not taught at school. And we know there are a lot of home languages that aren't taught at schools in the US. Um, and what we found was that 49% said that students in their district or school have not been able to earn the seal in languages not taught at their school. In other words, that 49% of participants had students in their school who had a language other than those taught at their school and that their students were not able to earn the seal in those languages. So um, what we asked them was how can that 51% of students or of uh, students who were observed, um, how can they demonstrate their proficiency in their home language? And we can see that the most common way was through tests. Um, the next was through projects or profiles. Um, through a transcript from another country, um, through coursework at um, an outside initiative such as Saturday school or community college, and then of course other. So those are some of the ways that students um, 
can show, uh, can demonstrate their proficiency. And note that um, there are only 288 participants of our 700 plus who responded to this with um, this information. So of course, one of the things we're really interested in, of course, um, is watch back, which is what are the influences on teaching and learning that might be coming about as a result of the seal of biliteracy? So we looked at the perceived impact on language learning. And um, so in terms of watch back in the classroom, um, of course, we couldn't observe classrooms uh, nationwide pre and post the seal in part because the seal has already started and um, we would have had to have done it a long time ago um, to see what the effect was. But we did ask participants about their perceptions of any change. So specifically, we asked them to rate on a scale of not at all to a great deal, the extent to which they believe the SEAL has helped increase language class enrollment, helped expand language class offerings, and, and change the way you or your school teach languages. And you can see that um, most participants didn't said that the SEAL has had um, no effect or a little effect. Now, this could be because the SEAL, again, is still quite nascent. It could be um, who responded to the survey, but that's just what we saw. Um, at this point. Okay. But of the respondents who did perceive changes to language teaching, this is really important, 64% um, of those respondents who saw some change cited that there was more proficiency-based instruction. So well, perhaps we'd like the SEAL to be having more of, an, of, a, of a washback effect, when it is having a washback effect, it seems the highest effect is on more proficiency-based instruction. Okay. So next we looked at, at barriers. What are the barriers to achieving the seal of biliteracy? We wanted to see how educators view these different val val uh, barriers to accessing the seal and which student groups we need to target most during outreach. So we asked which student student groups do you believe have the most trouble satisfying requirements for the SEAL and why? And they, again, were able to select multiple responses and then comment on the reasons they selected these groups. Um, and the group selected by most participants was that um, participants who were not currently enrolled in a world language course had um, the most barriers to satisfying the requirements. And this makes sense because participants said that since the bulk of promotion for the SEAL happens through teachers in world language classrooms, Students who aren't enrolled in these classes, um, you know, don't have as much access and have more barriers to obtaining the SEAL because they don't hear about it. So this is really important information for all of us as educators. All right, next. Um, so again, students not enrolled in world language courses lack information about the SEAL of biliteracy. And that some um, world language learners have trouble attaining intermediate proficiency within high school. That's a different barrier, right? And that English language learners have trouble satisfying English literacy requirements and accessing information about um, the other language proficiency. So these are the barriers. I think these are really um, tangible and these are things that we can work with and that we need to think about how to work with. So, of course, I have some discussion and some thoughts about all this. Um, one thing that we found in here is consistent with uh, previous research, which is that there's an over-reliance on world language to convey this information to students. Um, and of course, this makes sense. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the people in this audience are world language teachers, and that's a lot to put on you. Um, you know, if you're the only one saying to the students to take this, uh, to, to pursue the SEAL, it probably doesn't get heard as much as if it's coming from multiple places. Um, in addition, um, we found, and this confirms information from previous studies, that many school in, schools inform students about the SEAL too late. By 11th or 12th grade, some students sadly have stopped taking a world language or they're already at a point where another test might be too much or maybe they realize they haven't attained the level of language they need. So we need to move that information down. Um, we've also found limited evidence for positive washback. We found some, but I'd really love to see more. I'm sure we'll see more when the SEAL has been around longer, since of course some of the states with the most respondents um, haven't had the SEAL for very long, because of course the SEAL hasn't been in existence for very long. We also found that alternative means of certifying world 
language proficiency, such as community-based schools and portfolios, are underutilized, particularly in um, less commonly taught languages. And we also found that there is an information and an assessment gap, and these are barriers for L's and students who are not in, enrolled in world language classes. And this is really important. If you're not in a world language class, you're less likely to hear about this. In addition, if you're enrolled in a world language class and you exit from world language learning, you're less likely to hear about it, even if you still have a proficiency in that language because you're not taking that class. So some recommendations. Oh, good, I'm right on time and we're gonna have lots of, we're gonna have about 15 minutes to discuss. Um, the first is for promotion. We need to expand our outreach outside of world language. Um, and this is to help students and also to support our world language teachers of whom I'm sure there are many of you in this audience. Um, we need to reach out to ELA courses. Um, we need to reach out to guidance counselors. And we also need to reach out to student groups. I always think of the fact that, you know, in seventh grade, my daughter knew about this. I'm sure she heard it from her friends, right? Um, so we need to find other places to talk about the SEAL. We also need to start it earlier. We need to set this expectation, just like we do with the PSAT and the AP and IB and other courses um, that are associated with tests. We need to look at middle school and ninth grade, and we also need to make sure that when students are reaching the end of a language sequence, such as you know level three, that they know that this is the time for them to take the seal of biliteracy. We also need to find fac provide faculty who don't teach world languages information about the seal, because if they don't know about it and if it isn't provided in a way that they understand, they can't tell anybody about it, right? So we really need to work on that. Um, in terms of assessment, we also need to advocate for um, allocating a proportion of state world language funding toward assessment in less commonly taught languages. Uh, we really need to make an investment in these languages. For many students who are enrolled in world language classes, it's a default for the test to be covered, or at least there are more options for it. But we really need to make sure that um, there's funding for students to be assessed. We also need to train, invest in training community members to score student projects or portfolios, particularly in less commonly taught languages. Um, and finally, we also need to expand alternative means of demonstrating proficiency in a world language, such as um, portfolios or transcripts from community-based institutions. And it is 2.28, Drew, I am right on time. I want you to note that. Um, and I have some time for questions. Duly noted. Thanks, Dr. Malone. Uh, we, we do have quite a quite a few questions rolling through. Um, I can either read them for you. Um, let's see. We'll go ahead and start with first come, first served. How about that? Uh, any suggestions for enlisting more district support? Teachers are promoting, but it is difficult to encourage district support. What would you suggest? Um, so I have a shameless promotion of a totally free product on our AELRC website. Um, Margaret and some of um, our other students developed a two-page research brief on what is the seal of biliteracy. It's something that we developed, um, any of you who remember the 80s and 90s with the Eric Clearinghouse. I used to share these little two-page briefs with members of my family when I was first in linguistics because they didn't understand what the heck I was studying. Um, so this is something you can share with um, I would say you can share it with language people, obviously, but you can share it with non-language people. It's a brief that talks about what is the seal of biliteracy. I think sometimes we go straight to solution, like we need to get this out, so you need to start promoting this. You might want to start by explaining what the seal is to more people. You can share our brief or whatever works. I mean, if our brief works, great. If something else works, even better. Um, so I think the first thing we need to do is let people know about the seal of biliteracy in a way that they can understand it. Then the next phase, of course, is to uh, support that with, oh, so this is what, what it is in our state and district. This is what the levels mean. These are the tests and the ways that we can have it done. So I'd say start with um, you know, consciousness raising about the seal and then move into ways to support it. Does that help? I'm having a few trouble, a little bit of trouble seeing the questions. So Andrew's just gonna throw them at me and I'm just gonna answer them. Sounds good, rapid fire. Uh, yes, that was helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, another question. How can a school offer a test in a language that is not taught at the school? Um, so depending on what the language is, and I know that there are hundreds if not thousands of languages in the world, 
Sometimes there are tests that are approved that will meet your um, state guidelines. Um, the first thing I wanna always say, I always say is look at your state. Look to see what's required at your state, what is accepted at your state, because it differs state by state. And I would just never forgive myself if you went to someone and said, Meg says I can use this. So first start with your state, what's accepted, what's the level needed. In general, there are lots of tests, there are tests available in more languages than your school teaches, unless your school teaches like 21 languages. So I'd start with that. Um, then if it's a very less commonly test taught language, look at something like a portfolio or um, some of um, some of the you know tests that perhaps are not designed just for the seal of biliteracy, like the OPI. Um, one thing I like to point out is there are some tests that are perhaps cheaper for more students and some tests that are more expensive for fewer students. And that's something that if there's state and local money, that can be decided. One thing I sometimes say to administrators who ask me about tests is, at the end of this hour long meeting we had, we spent as much per hour on this meeting as we would have been buying tests for all the kids we're talking about. Okay, that Sorry, answers this question as well. Uh, where can one find a list of languages for, for which tests are available for the seal of biliteracy? Uh, yeah, I mean, another great resource is www.sealofbiliteracy.org. Um, they have a, a nice interactive map where you can kind of click on your state. Um, but as Dr. Malone mentioned, that that's a great place to start. Uh, you know, if if you have a contact, if you have a resource at the State Department of Ed, that is certainly the uh, the the best way to to do that to get the details there. Yeah, I, I just want to give a quick shout out to the www.sealofbiliteracy.org and Arthur Chow, who started this whole effort. Arthur is literally a tireless effort person who he's just led this tireless effort. I don't think the man sleeps or stops. And um, he's updating his website a lot, um, but always check the link because Arthur's fast, but sometimes states move at different paces. So just make sure to check your information. Okay, another question. Uh, what would you say to coordinators slash administration who think including tasks around the topics from the test and curriculum that it is quote unquote teaching to the test? Um, you can teach for proficiency, but you can't teach proficiency, right? Proficiency, it's all about practice, practice, practice. Um, I would say if um, if the only thing you're teaching in your classes are the topics that are identified on something like the Apple, um, that's a problem. I can't imagine any school that's doing that. Um, I'm sure you're teaching way more than those topics. Um, and really, you're not really teaching the test items because we don't release them. You're just giving students some familiarity with these basic topics. I also want to point out that as someone, hold on, I'm putting on my, my actual hat for just a second here. I'm just going to tell you a little secret. There aren't that many topics in the world that we talk about, right? So just think about it like that. Um, you know, family, school, work, sports, travel, what are the other topics, Andrew? Help me out here. I mean, those are the things we talk about. Politics, well, we don't put a lot of politics in our test, um, but those are the things we talk about every day. That's what's on any language test, right? So um, I would think of it as making the topic really broad so that you're getting your students really comfortable in talking about everything associated with that topic. It's not like we put something on, um, we, it's not as though test developers put something out there saying there will be an item on how to describe to Andrew that his haircut looks really good, right? <laughs> I don't know uh, if you got a haircut, Andrew. But. I don't think that would ever happen because this is uh, what I call the quarantine self-done cut. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. Um, I teach in a, at an independent school. Can we go to? Can we award the seal of biliteracy? You can go through your state. Definitely go through your state and figure out how to do that. Um, it's um, it's a state by state thing, and we think that that's a great way for you to pursue it. Um, check out what the requirements are in your state. Get in touch with your state coordinator. Um, and we definitely want to see your your students. We want all these kids to get the seal. Okay, next question. Is there a difference between the seal of biliteracy you were referring to and the one my state offers? It should be the same thing. It's just that the seal of biliteracy differs state to state. So we were looking at nationwide trends on how different states approach it and what kinds of regulations they have. Just like everything in, in, in the US, you know, it's state by state. Yeah. Uh, after how many years slash levels of, of language study should a student take the seal of biliteracy test? 
Oh gosh, that is the $64,000 question. Maybe it's a million dollar question now. Um, you want, this is what I would say, begin with the end in mind, figure out what the requirements are for your state. Some states like Minnesota have different levels of seal of biliteracy. I did not even go there, you'll note in this presentation where you could get like a platinum, a gold and a silver. Um, so you wanna think about what is the level that students need to get? Then I would look to see how does that articulate to your curriculum? How many years of language maps onto that? What kind of evidence do you have that shows that after X number of years, your students um, should basically be able to attain that level and then go backward? I think that's also a great way to look at your curriculum and determine what your goals are. Great. Is there any data on the impact of the seal for university acceptance or university credit acknowledgement? I, I mean, Andrew, did you put that in there? Because one of I my didn't. other students, uh, some of my other students at Georgetown and I'm Malik Stevenson and some others are looking at how the seal articulates from high school to college. There is not a lot of data out there yet, because I'll tell you, I think a, I think there are many people in the university who know even less about the SEAL than our counterparts in high school counseling offices and um, ESL teachers, administrators, and so on. So this research that we're doing has two parts. One is to find out what's going on, and the other is perhaps to gently raise consciousness, just like that, gently raise consciousness about the SEAL in higher education. Um, now, having said that, there are some states that are doing a terrific job at their state schools. Um, and then there are some states that there's just a real disconnect. So it's all, uh, like with everything, it's all local. Hmm. An example of one of those states would be Illinois, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where they have, you know, all state schools, uh, you know, the, the students are earning college credit for the seal of biliteracy. Uh, next question is, is there any chance of the SEAL being available for American Sign Language students? I administered the Regents exam in New York, but in Ohio, in, in Ohio we don't have a statewide assessment. Um, I'm not sure if the question is, will your state accept ASL as a language for this, or are there tests available? So, um, again, accepting, uh, uh, okay, I'm going to put on my actual hat again. We accept ASL as a world language. I think that's pretty predominant in the field. Um, you need to look to see what your state says. Um, and there are some tests being developed in ASL that hopefully states will um, accept toward the seal of biliteracy because they're being developed um, by organizations whose tests are already um, approved for the seal of biliteracy. How many independent schools are participating in the seal nationwide? Uh, we probably don't have that data at this point, do we? Um, although we don't that's something we could ask Arthur um, I would say probably more than we know um, and I hope that I hope that it will double triple and quadruple in the next few years but um, because just because you're at an independent school doesn't mean you shouldn't be pursuing the seal of biliteracy I think it's a great idea and it's another it's another way to show your students you know the value of what you're teaching them great uh, I'm at a private school in Alabama how can we begin the steps to implement this as a school since our state is, is still under consideration? Uh, I'm seeing that question pop up for uh, also a public school down in Kentucky. Um, so if your state doesn't have a seal of biliteracy, you need to uh, take some steps locally to have your students uh, credential themselves. Um, it may be that your state won't grant something. I would talk to somebody at LTI um, or whoever else is administering the tests that you're interested in to pursue that further. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we are working actually with, with several districts uh, down in Kentucky uh, who are in that same exact situation, right, where the legislation, you know, Kentucky is one of the few states where legislation has not yet passed at the state state level, although they are working on it. Um, but I will gladly reach out to you to, to discuss uh, and perhaps even put you in contact with uh, some of those district coordinators uh, who are going through that same exact process. Uh, and that's, again, both for public schools and, and private schools. Uh, how do we educate community employers? Employers don't know anything about the seal of my literacy, and if they do, they don't value it. Oh, well, I would start by like, just look at, I'm, I'm using the brief as an example because for one thing, it's if you print it out on very on our very pretty pink and blue letterhead, it 
it actually, it, I'm not being sarcastic, it really gets people's attention because it is very attractive. Um, you could hand that to them. You could explain, um, you could use, um, Actful has their recent survey on language and business that you could share with local businesses. I would also say, um, uh, last year, a little anecdote, I was working on my alumni class um, officer nomination process, which kept me from being nominated a class officer, so I highly recommend it. And um, one thing someone told me was, um, particularly women, you need to ask women multiple times um, before they'll agree to do something. And I think that's true of all people. You tell somebody something once, I don't know how many of you have kids, I tell my kids something once, they usually don't hear it unless it's like dinner and it's your favorite. You need to tell people things multiple times and you need to tell them in ways that they're gonna hear it. As a language person, sometimes what I say doesn't reach you know, my engineering friends, so I need to put it in a spin that she or he can understand based on their context. Just when, just like when they're telling me about their work, it doesn't speak to me as a language person unless I find some context for it. So I would just encourage you to, um, you know, try having a dialogue, you know, what's important about language to you, what are some issues you find when communication is breaking down, um, like, my own um, my own children speak some Spanish because they had it in elementary school, and it's been really helpful to my son and his work. Um, not necessarily that he's um, <clears throat> well, he's still in college, so obviously he's not doing like high level language like negotiating tre treaties. But it's really helpful to him when he's communicating with customers or even just talking to other people he works with. So you might want to start with the need and then move to what the usefulness is. Great. And that uh, the survey that Dr. Malone mentioned that, that ACTFL did, it's called Making Languages Our Business. Um, I definitely, yeah, I, I second that notion where uh, we've had plenty of, of folks come back to us and, and talk about how helpful it is for not only language people, but especially non-language people, right? To kind of put it into perspective and to show how how useful those language skills are for these students once they earn the seal of biliteracy and, and move on to their next steps. Uh, do you... Do you believe that using the WIDA assessment would be acceptable as an assessment that is used for the seal of biliteracy? Um, so again, what's my mantra? Check in your state. For most uh, English language learners who are taking the WIDA um, assessment in their state, the WIDA access, that should work. But I would double check because, um, you know, again, it's statewide. But in general, the WIDA assessment does work for um, English proficiency for L's in states that use uh, WIDA as its uh, proficiency assessment for English. Great. Uh, what is needed for ACTFL to consider creating assessments in less commonly taught languages? Um, I'm happy to answer this one, Meg. Yeah, okay. Um, so at, at current, the Apple is, is offered in 13 languages. Uh, the OPI slash WPT for the seal of biliteracy is now offered in 22 less commonly taught languages. Um, Liz, I will reach out to you afterwards to kind of give you the full list so you so you can uh, make your way through it. Um, as Dr. Malone mentioned before, there there is also the the OPI uh, that that is sometimes used, and again, it depends on the state. Um, it is sometimes used for the uh, the really less commonly taught languages, uh, so to speak. Uh, how can we better understand the true value uh, to the student? How can we better understand the true value to the student of earning the seal of biliteracy in a world where there are already so many tests and assessments? It's a great question. I would actually uh, flip that and say, when there are so many tests and assessments, why is language, why is world language not one of them? So um, if you look at the original um, No Child Left Behind uh, legislation, World languages was actually a core subject. It just wasn't mandatory to be assessed. So world language is considered a core subject um, by the US Department of Education. Um, I also think, now I'm a language geek, but I actually think language assessments are way more fun than a lot of those other assessments. You actually get to show what you can do. You get to show how you can converse, how you read in the language, um, how well you can eavesdrop. I mean, listen, um, how well you can write. That's the whole purpose of the seal of biliteracy. And I would say to students, the point of this assessment isn't to, you know, layer on another assessment as a burden, but rather an opportunity to show that world language is so important that it is something that we want to assess and show the world how we're doing. And as a researcher, I just want to say, 
if you ever want to work with me to write up your results and publish what kind of uh, proficiency results you're getting in your district or state, we would love to do that. We want to see more of that. We want to see more after X amount of time, this is the kind of outcomes we're getting because we just don't have the bandwidth in our field to do that as much as in other, in other um, fields. Great. Next one is, is more of a, uh, a comment than a question. Uh, the, the recommendations that you presented are extremely valid. Uh, they're not unlike recs I made to my district after having done a pilot in 2017 to 2018. I created briefs and did FAQ sheets and other promotional materials. We haven't been able to move on to the implementation of recs. Uh, what we really need is a coordinated support and more concrete tools to help us promote. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I would also look at the seal of biliteracy page. There are some um, there are some tools there to help you continue promoting. And I mean, I hate to ask anybody to do anything else during this time, but I would also say to you, just keep trying. Um, we love languages. We we want you to get there, but um, sometimes you need to go keep going even when you're told no. Which is I hate saying that to you because I know it's so hard. I also want to suggest to you that having your students talk about how they want their language to be recognized is really important. Um, I did a little project with some students who detained the seal of biliteracy last year. I, I can't give specifics. Um, and they sent me some video and honestly, granted it was in the midst of the pandemic, but it was the nicest thing I did all year. Like just seeing these students say, I got the seal, I'm so excited. Um, just kind of you know, made my April worth it. Um, and I think very often we have to think about what's the context in which the person we're talking to is operating. Um, they might not think that your opinion is as critical as your students and how they benefit from it. Not because they don't respect you, but because they have so much else in their plate. Sorry. Keep going. Um, and well, speaking of barriers. Um, this attendee mentions that the COVID-19 has become a barrier. Uh, she is in an urban district in New Haven, uh, and we have been remote since the beginning of the school year, and promoting the seal of biliteracy was, was a major barrier. And any recommendations to, to getting the message through? I can comment on the testing side of it, um, but as far as the, the promotion goes? Um, promotion, I would say, um... I would take the same approach to anything else, which is to mention it early, often, and in many different ways. Um, I would also say for students, um, one of the nice things about the SEAL is, again, it's something that they do. It's not necessarily like some other tests they take that you um, have to prepare and it seems kind of ethereal. Language is very concrete. Um, so I would tell them multiple ways, multiple times. I would also reach out to some student groups because um, depending on how active student groups are in your district, it could be that the student government group can become active in letting students know about the seal. It could be that the um, individual, like my, my best friend actually is a French teacher um, and she knows all about this. I mean, she knows about it independent of me, but she still sometimes comes to you with questions. So you can look at it both by language, um, by languages, by um, different groups within your school and just keep getting it out there. You never know who's gonna be your, your best cheerleader. Um, it could end up that like the math club ends up being your cheerleader because, you know, the kids in the math club think it's super cool to take X language and they all want to get the seal. So I would say reach out broadly and get your friends from other departments involved. Like we all go to faculty meetings and we often sit next to people who aren't necessarily in our field. Let them know what's going on and say to them, this is such an opportunity. How can we get this across to the kids? Give them a problem to help you solve. Uh, and as far as testing goes, uh, fortunately, that barrier has been broken down with the, you know, the at-home testing options that are provided uh, for assessments such as such as ACTFL assessments. And of course, I, I will I, I can reach out with more information on that. Um, next question: If I teach, um, wait, at Andrew, a, can I speak sure. to that too? Um, of course. As a as a researcher, um, some of my colleagues in the field did an analysis. Um, it was Dan Isbell and. Um, Benji Kremel, I think, who did an analysis of, uh, if you could put that, is there a, a chat that you could put the link to that in for us, Andrew? I can, yes. Um, so two of my colleagues did an analysis of um, different tests and how their at-home approaches worked. Um, this might be something that would help your administration. 
um, to say to them, hey, here are two um, super famous language testers, household names, I'm sure, but they're household names to me, um, who I think you might really um, benefit from. It looks like I can't put the link in the chat, but I will follow up via email with, with the link to, the, to that study. Yeah, can you send it to everybody who is here? Because of course, the more people who click on Benji and Dan's um, study, the better. They're both pre-tenure, so I like for um, <laughs> I like for them to get some uh, some attention because they did a wonderful job with this. Uh, if I teach at an American Curriculum International School that is located outside the U.S., can a student apply for the Seal of Biliteracy? Can the student earn the Seal of Biliteracy? Andrew, I, I don't actually know the answer to that. Uh, that that may be an Arthur question, actually. So I, I will say this is a good time to mention the the new the new guidelines, right? Um, the, so sealabyliteracy.org, um, along with NABE and Actful and a few other organizations, uh, did just release brand new guidelines. Essentially, you know, the pathways to uh, the implement implementation of the seal by literacy. I will also uh, send the link to those new guidelines. Um, and it, it, it's guidelines not only for, again, not just public schools, not just private schools, but you know, charter schools, international schools as well. So we can certainly follow up on that. Uh, looks like we are quickly running out of time, although uh, we, we've even gone over time if, if we were aiming for the four, 45 minute. People, uh, let me mark. just say, if, 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 if you can stay, Andrew, I can, but people who need to go, I'm totally not offended. Just go if you need to go and please know how much we all value your work and all of the flexibility you're showing in these really, really tough times. And um, I'm just so grateful to all of you. And I hope um, to see a lot of you in person um, the next time I give a presentation like this. And, um, you know, hang in there. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, take, and, I'll take questions as long as people want to stay and Andrew doesn't have something else to do. Great. Uh, anything better than this to do? I, absolutely absolutely not. Um, and, and I will remind everyone that a recording of this entire uh, webinar will, will be automatically sent to all attendees. So if you missed the beginning, if, if you have to leave uh, right now, then, then you can certainly catch up um, afterwards. Let's see. Quite a few more questions. Um, Oh, okay. Here's a nice comment. Uh, when when we were discussing that school in Alabama as well as uh, down in Kentucky, Fayette County, Kentucky has the seal of biliteracy. Laura Youngworth is the district war language specialist. I'm sure she would be happy to share her experience with other district school leaders in the state. Um, I can uh, definitely verify that. Uh, Laura is amazing. Uh, if if you already know her, please uh, feel free to reach out. She's she's very happy to. Uh, to help others, not only in Kentucky, but you know, throughout the nation. If you do not know her, um, just re reply to the email that I send following this webinar, and I will be happy to, to introduce you. She's a wonderful resource. Um, and again, Kentucky is, is one of the few states where state level uh, legislation has not yet passed for the seal by literacy, but her district is, is still awarding it. Um, let's see. Uh, another another question about states and districts. Our state is not a seal by literacy state, but we have individual districts who offer a seal. Uh, how do states offer seal options or support for EL students who are not in dual language programs? What kind of support is there in states for EL students where there is no support for these students for the seal? I would start with the school. Um, I don't know if you mean financial support or emotional support. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I would say most EL students, though, because they have to take a state English language test, will at least have that part taken care of. And um, I would also um, say you can reach out to Arthur and some of the other folks on the Seal by Literacy page uh, website to um, find out some things that have worked in these situations because. We're all in this together, and there are a lot of people who've had some really successful approaches. But as I mentioned, like everyone who works in language, we just keep doing it. It takes a while. I actually was involved in some of the early efforts for the SEAL, and um, they date back to when I did not have any gray hair. It's not showing up in here. 
Um, they date back to when I only had one child and my daughter's 17. So let's put it that way. Uh, so back to your study, Dr. Malone, did, did, any, did you have anyone report that they have used the OPI to determine proficiency? So we're referring back to that slide where we show different assessments used? Yeah, I think, I think the OPI and the WPT were like number four, but we like to do things in three because, you know, threes are nice and they fit better on the slide. Um, but yes, a decent number of, um, of participants are using the OPI, often coupled with the writing proficiency test to demonstrate proficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, another great comment here. Uh, I, I, I was able to connect my sister in Sweden with a student in Lexing Lexington, Kentucky, who wanted to get the seal in Swedish. Her father is a native speaker. Uh, and my sister and her fellow teacher friend went through a brief meeting with district war language specialists and then conducted and recorded the assessment. The student passed. So if there isn't a test anywhere, it's still possible. There we go, right? One, one thing I often say to people is, um, you know, the languages in which there are tests available, that should be pretty straightforward. And then we can focus, what I'm hoping is that these things become more automatic so we can focus our attention on languages where there isn't a test available um, so we can really put our time and attention into doing that. And again, please don't despair. We're still really early in this process. Um, it's just that 2020 has been such a long year. It feels like the SEAL has been around about 10 years longer than we think because it's been a long year. Okay, will the webinar be available later? Yes, we have confirmed that. Let's see, anything else? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> I won't read the, the first sentence, but it's something about uh, teaching languages in a particular state. Uh, do you have any contacts? Uh, well, I, I guess we can address this uh, um, uh, offline via email. But looking at a particular state, do you have any contacts within that particular state uh, to start the movement for the seal of biliteracy? Looks like this is another state um, in which you know state level legislation has not been passed. As I mentioned, I mean even you know individuals like your Laura Youngworth that, that another attendee mentioned, uh, they are going to be excellent resources because they've kind of been there, done that. Um, and yes, the, the great thing about providing, you know, uh, language assessments nationwide is, is we do have contacts in, in um, all different states. So um, I will reach out to you with that contact for your particular state. This is an interesting one. Is anyone lobbying for the SEAL with a new administration in D.C.? Have we heard anything about that yet, Meg? <laughs> um. I would say that um, this administration is very pro-education. Um, I think that we are well uh, situated for it. We also have to remember that um, I cannot tell you to lobby, um, but I can say that advocating for your needs at all levels of government is a great way to make things happen. Um, I think I'm walking a fine line here, so I hope I hope you understand that what I'm saying is um, it's local and it's national when you need something to happen. And in addition, um, as somebody who uh, does advocacy and lives outside of Washington, D.C. and before the pandemic, spent, you know, a decent amount of time on the Hill, um, although I'm not a lobbyist, um, it's not just um, the executive office that has an influence. It's also state and uh, national con uh, Congresses. Okay, and I've got two more questions here. Uh, could SEAL by Literacy support organizations that have concentrated on world language students team up with ELL slash ESL organizations to bring these two pieces together? Absolutely. I would say locally, um, especially with, you know, I would say the pandemic is hard because we're all so zoomed out and we're so tired. Um, not that we weren't tired before. But it's also an opportunity to, um, if you have friends in ESL, to reach out to them and say, how are you doing? And tell them what's going on. I really believe that our ESL teachers are our best advocates for this. We just need to give them the information and help them share it. I actually, I'm going to tell you another story. I once, my daughter forgot her lunch or my son, one of my kids forgot their lunch a few years ago and I was dropping it off at the high school. And as I was leaving, I saw a student sitting with not a language teacher because, you know, um, but with someone from the guidance office and they were going through 
I live in Arlington County, Arlington's bilingual pamphlet and how to get credit in your language in Spanish. And they were discussing it in two languages, like whatever words they had in the language. And I'm not kidding. I left, I got in my car and I started crying. So I said, this is exactly what we want. We want, um, we want advocacy for these students to be happening for these students, not for language or for math or science, but for our students, because language is good for our students. Great. Um, and one interesting, again, it's more of a comment than a question, but I don't understand why there is not a you know nationwide policy on the seal of biliteracy, why it has to be different uh, state by state. Any comments on that, Dr. Malone? I think it's quite typical to how governing happens in the U.S. Um, so that's, you know, that's how it is. And I should just add that before I went into this field, I went to an independent school um, in high school. And I was going to say undergraduate, I guess, elementary and, um, and middle school as well. Um, and and it's, it is different at independent schools. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. I actually I have a friend who teaches at an independent school in, in the K-8 program. And, um, I regularly educate her about the seal of biliteracy, and she regularly educates me about science and math. So um, it's we do talk about other things, but it, it's a great way from like she was talking about her daughter who's taking Chinese, and I was like, oh, who's your daughter's Chinese teacher? And she told me, and I was like, oh, I know her. My friend was like, of course you did, but it had just never occurred to her like, oh, Meg does this, thus she must know the Chinese teacher at my school. So it was a great little like. So next I'll be saying to her, so. Have you thought about the seal of biliteracy? Your daughter's in fifth grade. Uh, and one more has bubbled up and, and we'll go ahead and, and leave it at that. Um, what are the school slash class, and I'll go ahead and add slash district uh, requirements to be certified to offer the seal of biliteracy? Is there a certification? Uh, process that I as a school have to, to go through to, to be able to offer the seal? I would look again, I always go back to the state. Early in the seal, I think we tried to answer too many questions and we didn't send enough people back to their state regs and it led to confusion. Go to your state and find out what the process is. The other thing I would suggest to you is if you're trying to go through a process like this, which is sometimes bureaucratic and tough, I would say ace yourself. I think the idea that you're going to sit down and finish all the forms in a in a day or so um, is tough and ask for help. Um, there are lots of, you know, Twitter boards and uh, other, you know, support systems out there in the Internet that can help you. Like you could put something out there. Have you done this in your state? And I'm sure somebody will offer you help, if not a template for what they did. Great. Okay, and we will go ahead and leave it at that. Um, I, again, for those of you who, who asked questions and, and we weren't able to get to them, um, we will of course be following up um, specifically the, those links to the studies that were referenced, the, the resources, uh, one of them coming from, you know, the, the AELRC uh, for, you know, the advocacy of your language programs uh, as, as well as the seal of biliteracy. Um, I will go ahead and have, have Dr. Malone make her closing remarks, but I would also like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, again, as uh, to reiterate what she said, you know, dur during this time, it, it really means a lot for um, for us to, you know, be able to uh, to provide Dr. M Malone and her and her great wisdom, and of course the experience that she gained through this survey and through all the great work and research that she's been doing uh, to provide you with everything that you need to to implement uh, you know, th this great phenomenon that that the seal of biliteracy has become. So thank you very much. I, I will be in touch soon, and Dr. Malone, I'll, I'll leave it to you. I just want to start again by saying thank you, and we see you, and we appreciate you. Um, one little story, when I went to back to school night on, on Zoom, my daughter came in and she said to me, why don't you have your camera on, Mom? And I said, the other parents don't. And she said, my teachers are lonely. Please put on your camera. So I really see you. It's really hard. Um, having said that, um, I think we found out through the pandemic and how we've communicated about it, just how important language is, not just communicating information, but how you communicate it and where and the words you use and how you put it together, whether it's orally or visually or both. And so language has never been more visual, you know, visible in our culture. Um, third, I would say be patient with yourself 
um, you need to give yourself time to make this change. It took a long time to get the seal implemented just when it started in California. So be patient with yourself and um, try to be patient with the process, which is tough. And then the third is um, let your students be advocates for this. Tell them how exciting it is. Find students who've done it. Um, students learn from each other as much, if not more, than they learn from us. And so let them be um, the drivers in this. Um, and again, thank you. I think we're about three and a half weeks from a lot of people's winter breaks. I hope during winter break, those of you who are getting one, I hope you all get one, spend a lot of time not being on Zoom or Teams or WebEx um, or anything else. And um, I wish you all a wonderful December. And thanks for being here. Great, thank you. And you've got Meg's, um, as well as her colleague Margaret's email address is right there on the screen. I just posted mine in the chat. Uh, for any of you who may have specific uh, questions or, or needs as, as far as uh, language assessment goes. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, um, and we will be in touch shortly. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Andrew. My pleasure. <laughs>